You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to episode 189 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Welcome to the podcast. With the last episode, we continued setting the stage for the Battle of Antietam, which took place on Wednesday, September 17th, 1862. In the last show, as y'all recall, we took our discussion right up to Tuesday the 16th, the day before the battle. Yep. And so far, we've seen that George McClellan has um, passed on two opportunities to attack Lee at Sharpsburg. The first opportunity was on Monday, September 15th, when the Federals, advancing from South Mountain, first closed up on Sharpsburg. And then the second missed opportunity was the next day, on Tuesday the 16th. In a telegram to General-in-Chief Henry Halleck on Tuesday morning, McClellan had said he would attack the enemy that day, but Little Mac actually made no move to fulfill that promise. McClellan realized, however, that if Lee was still there in front of him, there across the Antietam on the 17th, then he would simply have to attack the rebels. Because if McClellan wanted to prove he could fight and win battles, then come Wednesday, there could be no putting off an attack any longer. Exactly. And remember, we said that by putting off his attack until Wednesday, Little Mac was actually, inadvertently, increasing his chances of inflicting a decisive defeat on almost the whole of Lee's army. That's because if the Federals would have attacked at Sharpsburg late on Monday or early on Tuesday, they were facing only a portion of Lee's force, about 15,000 men. But by midday on Tuesday, with the arrival of Stonewall Jackson, with two divisions from Harper's Ferry, the number of Confederates in McClellan's grasp increased. And then two more divisions of Confederates would arrive from Harper's Ferry before the battle began on Wednesday. And so on the 17th, when McClellan finally attacked, he'd actually have the chance to destroy even more of Lee's army. And since more Federals were also coming up, McClellan was maintaining a nearly two-to-one numerical advantage over Lee. Correct. Although, as we've already said, McClellan was still continuing his tendency to inflate Confederate numbers. So, in reality, he had a substantial numerical superiority over Lee. But, in Little Mac's mind, the two armies at Sharpsburg were a lot more evenly matched. It's very important to remember that point. Okay, and so in any case, on Tuesday... McClellan began laying the groundwork for his big attack the next day. And by saying he began laying the groundwork, we're being generous, because despite having all day on the 16th to get his ducks in a row, Little Mac did nothing to gain an accurate picture of the enemy's dispositions, and didn't furnish his corps commanders with written orders, nor did he consult with them to explain his thinking and objectives in any detail. This lack of communication creates serious problems for the historian 
trying to figure out just what little Mac intended to do on September 17th and how he planned to do it. To this day, trying to untangle McClellan's battle plan at Antietam is complicated and confusing. When you're discussing McClellan's plan for Antietam, and when you're looking at what happened during the battle, we think it's important to always keep three things in mind. The first thing to keep in mind is that George B. McClellan was an absolutely inept, incompetent, pathetic field general. He may have been a top-notch administrator and organizer, but Little Mac had neither the moral courage nor professional skill that were needed to successfully command a Civil War army in the field in the presence of the enemy. The second thing to keep in mind is that, as we've already mentioned, McClellan was continuing his chronic tendency to exaggerate or overestimate Confederate numbers. So this leads to the fact that Little Mac's battle plan is best understood if it's seen as a scheme designed to cope with an enemy of nearly equal strength. And then the third thing to keep in mind is that McClellan didn't approach Antietam as a battle that was his to win, but instead he viewed it as a fight that he couldn't afford to lose. Even given his pitiful command performance, and especially considering his estimate of Confederate numbers, it's pretty clear to us that at Antietam, Little Mac was never truly playing for the win. His primary concern instead was that he not suffer a disastrous defeat. As Rich said just a moment ago, McClellan didn't furnish his corps commanders with written orders, nor did he consult with them to explain his thinking and objectives in any detail. This understandably seems to have left his generals in some doubt as to what exactly Little Mac expected of them. It was only after the battle that he would compose a general description of his plan, and even then he produced two different versions. Writing some four weeks after the battle, McClellan said that the, quote, design was to make the main attack upon the enemy's left, at least to create a diversion in favor of the main attack, with the hope of something more by assailing the enemy's right. And as soon as one or both of the flank movements were fully successful, to attack their center with any reserve I might then have on hand. McClellan's final report, written later and published in 1864, modified his earlier explanation, particularly in regard to the movement against Lee's right. Here, Little Mac would write, quote, My plan for the impending general engagement was to attack the enemy's left with the corps of Hooker and Mansfield, supported by Sumner's, and if necessary, by Franklin's. And as soon as the matter looked favorably there, to move the corps of Burnside against the enemy's extreme right upon the ridge running to the south and rear of Sharpsburg, and having carried their position to pass along the crest toward our right, and wherever either of these flank movements should be successful, to advance our center with all the forces then disposable. That final report is highly suspect. Written well after the fact, it very obviously was intended to rationalize the maneuvers that actually occurred during the battle and to respond to criticisms. The preliminary report, dated October 15th, almost certainly gives a far more credible picture of McClellan's actual plan for the battle, such as it was. But attempting to decipher just what Little Mac was saying in that preliminary report raises more questions than it answers. It's evident he intended to hit Lee with a right hook in the northern sector of the battlefield. Beyond that, things get less clear. Burnside's role at the southern end of the line is less certain. Was his mission a diversion or a full-scale assault? Would it come simultaneously with Hooker's attack or subsequent to it? When his flanking efforts to the north and south had achieved an unspecified degree of success, Little Mac would then unleash his reserves in the center. It's worth noting, though, that especially in the preliminary report, McClellan's use of language when referring to this element of his plan is vague and betrays a lack of resolve. Beyond that, however, the question here with regard to actually unleashing those reserves against Lee's center for the coup de grace 
would be Little Mac's conception of success with regard to the flank assaults and his ability to assess the enemy's condition. Would nothing less than the complete rout of the rebels at the north and south ends of the line be the prerequisite for action in the center? Or would signs of Confederate exhaustion and imminent collapse qualify? Perhaps more importantly, would McClellan possess the moral courage necessary to go all in and commit all his forces at hand to deliver the death blow to the enemy? As we've already indicated, we don't think Little Mac was ever really playing for the win at Antietam, since he overestimated Confederate numbers and he was too afraid of failure, and he lacked the aggressive instincts necessary for success on the battlefield. But, but having said that, We also have to say that despite the nebulous nature of McClellan's battle plan, and in spite of his want of tactical skill with regard to directing the fighting, the Federals still, still had an excellent chance to crush the rebels at Antietam. That's because Lee's flanks were vulnerable, his center weak, and he had few, very few reserves. His back was to the Potomac, and his line of retreat depended on Bottler's Ford. A federal breakthrough on any portion of Lee's line, if vigorously exploited, could have spelled disaster for the outnumbered Confederates. But an adequate plan has to be adequately executed, and in the end, Little Mac wasn't enough of a field general to do even that much. Besides that, organizational matters within the Army of the Potomac boded ill for the upcoming battle. As y'all recall at the start of the campaign, McClellan had decided to divide the Army of the Potomac into three wings. The left wing was led by 6th Corps Commander William Franklin. The center wing was under the direction of 2nd Corps Commander Edwin Sumner. And the right wing was commanded by the 9th Corps' Ambrose Burnside. But then on the eve of the Battle of Antietam, McClellan abruptly and without explanation abandoned his wing system. McClellan selected Joseph Hooker's 1st Corps to spearhead the attack on the Confederate left. Hooker would be supported by the 12th Corps. The 12th Corps had, until recently, very recently, been under the temporary command of Alpheus Williams, but 48 hours before the battle, its new commander, Joseph Mansfield, arrived. At any rate, by dispensing with the wing structure, Little Mac removed Hooker from Burnside's command and took the 12th Corps from Sumner's control. McClellan's tampering left Sumner frustrated, but infuriated Burnside. Little Mac offered no rationale for his reshuffling, and took no steps to soothe Burnside's bruised ego. McClellan's refusal to do so left the disgruntled Burnside thinking like a wing commander with no wing, and this state of affairs would contribute to the problems on the Union left on the 17th. To appreciate the tactical problem as McClellan understood it, it's important to remember that he overestimated the size of the Confederate force opposite him on September 17th. In his final report on the battle, Little Mac would state that Lee had just over 97,400 troops at Antietam against his own 87,160. Neither figure corresponds with reality. As always, McClellan wildly exaggerated enemy strength, and here he also overestimated the size of his own force by counting all the troops officially credited to a unit whether they were actually present for action. However, there's good reason to think that McClellan actually believed he had a slight superiority in troop strength on September 17th. At the start of the campaign, McClellan had accepted his cavalry chief's, Alfred Pleasanton's, estimate of Confederate strength as 110,000, and then this was reduced to 100,000. If Little Mac really believed the report that Lee had suffered 15,000 casualties in the fighting for the gaps at South Mountain, then Confederate numbers at Sharpsburg, by McClellan's accounting, are are reduced to around 85,000 against 87,000 Federals. 
Again, we'll point out that Little Mac's battle plan, such as it was, is best understood if we see it as designed to cope with an enemy force of nearly, if not quite, equal strength. Those numbers only have meaning, though, as an indication of how McClellan, in his own mind, viewed the numerical strength of the two armies. But by the best estimates available, the Army of the Potomac's actual strength on September 17th would be 72,500 men. McClellan apparently formulated his plan on the afternoon and evening of the 16th, after he had decided the battle would take place the next day. But, as we've said, the thought process that produced his plan remains unknown. There's no evidence that he sought a significant amount of advice from his staff, and he issued no written general orders on the 16th. Despite having ample time to do so, he called no conference of his corps commanders to outline his intentions. He did meet with Hooker on Tuesday afternoon and with Burnside that evening, but the orders Little Matt gave them were far from precise. In any case, as we've already indicated, it's telling that it was only after the battle that McClellan would compose a general description of his plan, and the explanations in his two reports and in his post-war memoirs were obviously heavily influenced by hindsight. At any rate, as we'll see in just a few minutes, McClellan's opening move would be to send Hooker's first corps across the Antietam at the Upper Bridge on Tuesday afternoon. When Hooker complained that his lone corps would be at the mercy of the rebels if left alone there on the northern sector of the battlefield, McClellan ordered the 12th Corps to cross the stream and join Hooker. It was understood that Hooker would be in command of the Union troops on this sector of the field, so the addition of the 12th Corps brought his total force to perhaps 20,000 men. On the Union Army's opposite flank, that is to the south, the 9th Corps, totaling about 13,000 men, would deploy so as to threaten the lower bridge, the Rohrbach Bridge. In the center, facing the middle bridge, McClellan posted the 2nd Corps, At nearly 18,000 mostly veteran troops, this was his largest and strongest formation. It was backed up by two divisions of Fitz John Porter's 5th Corps and Pleasanton's Cavalry Division. The two divisions of Franklin's 6th Corps would arrive from Pleasant Valley and join Porter early on the morning of the 17th, and with Porter's 5th Corps troops would form the Army's General Reserve. McClellan thus started off by keeping more than 45,000 men under his direct command, fronting the middle bridge and the most direct road to Sharpsburg. History never says goodbye. It just says... See you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. 
Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Let's assume, based on his preliminary report of the battle, that the sequence of attacks McClellan envisioned was that first, Hooker would attack Lee's northern flank, then Burnside would move against the southern end of the rebel line. If those flank attacks succeeded in breaking the Confederate line or diverting troops from Lee's center, McClellan would then attack the center of the rebel position with the forces massed in his own center, opposite the middle bridge. However, McClellan also allowed for the possibility that he might have to send forces from his center to aid Hooker and or Burnside, either to exploit a success or to backstop a repulse. In that case, Little Mac's ability to attack the Confederate center would be limited, as he pointed out by, quote, any reserve I might then have on hand. The disproportionate massing of troops in the Federal Center is an indication that McClellan considered this the critical sector, either the springboard of a triumphant assault or the bulwark of a final defense. That view is supported by the fact that he also chose to concentrate his cavalry at the center of his line. Those 4,300 Union horsemen would have been better employed on the flanks of the army. The only reason for McClellan to keep his cavalry massed in the center would have been to exploit an infantry breakthrough at that point, a classic Napoleonic tactic, but one that was hopelessly outdated by the second year of the Civil War. The units massed above the middle bridge were those Little Mac considered the best in the army, the 2nd, 5th, and 6th Corps that had fought under his command on the peninsula. The 5th and 6th Corps were each reduced to two divisions and 12,500 troops, but the soldiers were veterans. The commanders Fitzjohn Porter and William Franklin were McClellan loyalists. Through most of the upcoming battle, Little Mac would keep Porter close at hand as confidant and chief advisor. 65-year-old Edwin Bull Sumner commanded the 18,000-strong 2nd Corps. Its power lay in quality as well as mass. Its soldiers were veterans of the Peninsula Campaign. Its division commanders were combat-tested and among the best in the Army. So were most of its brigadiers. If properly utilized, 2nd Corps had the power to deliver a decisive blow. But McClellan had long had doubts about Sumner's ability. Unfortunately, though, for Little Mac, Sumner was the highest-ranking corps commander in the Army of the Potomac, which meant he would automatically take charge of any sector of the battlefield where he was employed. So it's likely Little Mac, with his initial deployment, tried to ensure himself against any potential blundering by Sumner by keeping the old man directly under his thumb in the Army center. The heavy guns of the Army's artillery reserve were posted south of the Middle Bridge on a steep ridge overlooking Antietam Creek. From that position, the 20-pounder Parrot rifles had the range to hit nearly any point on the battlefield, and they were immune to counter-battery fire because Confederate guns couldn't reach them. McClellan had postponed the battle until these Federal cannon had come up and were in position because he believed their firepower would offset the disadvantage he faced in having to assume the offensive against an enemy of nearly equal strength. The initial concentration of strength there at the center of the Federal line also gave McClellan insurance in case Hooker and or Burnside met with disaster. It no doubt seemed quite possible to Little Mac that Lee was strong enough to defeat one or both Federal flank attacks, in which case, if all did not go well, those trusted veterans massed in the center would be the Union Army's last line of defense. The center-weighted Federal alignment had a further advantage for McClellan. By holding nearly two-thirds of his total force in the center under his immediate control, Little Mac reserved to himself the maximum authority and flexibility in conducting the battle. He alone was in a position to decide whether to take more risk by throwing more troops into Hooker's or Burnside's attacks, or to minimize that risk by either withholding his reserves or using them defensively. And to a general who had to prove that he could fight and win battles, this flexibility carried enormous significance. But the flexibility of the plan also served to mask a weakness in Little Mac's generalship, 
because it's clear from the way the battle unfolded and from the ambiguity, even in his preliminary report, that McClellan hadn't decided where and how to strike the decisive blow against Lee. Little Mac's tactical dispositions seemed to allow him to postpone the critical choices, but in reality, the geography of the battlefield severely limited his options for using the concentration of strength at the center of his line. For example, the Second Corps was nominally available to reinforce Hooker, but it would take it at least an hour and a half to march from the center, cross the Antietam at the upper bridge, and arrive at the northern sector of the battlefield. Of course, the alternative to such a roundabout move was for the center units to cross the middle bridge and assail Lee's center in an all-or-nothing assault. But if McClellan's plan clearly indicates anything, it clearly indicates that he would only launch such an attack on the rebel center if Hooker or Burnside had already, quote, succeeded. McClellan's orders to Burnside were in keeping with the ambiguity of his commitment to the offensive. On Tuesday evening, Little Mac told Burnside he would have to, quote, attack the enemy's right on the following morning, end quote. Nothing in McClellan's vague instructions communicated any sense of urgency to Burnside. For example, no time was specified for the Ninth Corps' attack. In fact, Burnside, not unreasonably, assumed that nothing more than a diversion was required from the Ninth Corps on Wednesday. Moreover, McClellan also assigned Ninth Corps a defensive task to guard the Army's southern flank against a possible attack by a strong Confederate column that might arrive on the scene from Harper's Ferry. This, too, was an indication to Burnside that Ninth Corps wasn't expected to make an all-out assault on Wednesday morning. So McClellan not only started off by keeping the majority of the army massed in the center under his immediate control, thereby limiting the forces he entrusted to Hooker and Burnside, but he also didn't inform them of the tactical plan, such as it was, for the battle they were about to fight. McClellan's failure to discuss his plans in any detail with his subordinates and his failure to issue written orders was almost certainly intentional. That way, no one, neither within the Army nor in Washington, would know whether his battle plan had been amazingly brilliant or stupendously awful. By not discussing his plan for the battle in any detail with his principal lieutenants and by not issuing written orders to them, McClellan maintained maximum flexibility as far as his ability to claim credit for a victory or to find a scapegoat in the event of a disaster. But what was good for George McClellan wasn't helpful to the generals who had to fight his battle. McClellan would try to control the entire operation from his headquarters at the Pry House, between the middle and upper bridges, on the high ground on the east side of the Antietam. Little Mac's failure to budge from that location for most of the battle would severely limit his understanding of the fighting as it unfolded and would hamper his ability to respond to rapidly changing circumstances on the battlefield. Yet despite all that McClellan got wrong, even his half-formed plan, if adequately executed, would have subjected Lee's defense to unbearable pressure. That's because Lee's force, of course, was far from the 85,000 Little Mac imagined. When the fighting started on the morning of September 17th, Lee could muster no more than 36,000 and perhaps as few as 31,000 troops. McClellan had 60,000 troops immediately at hand with another 12,500 from 6th Corps on the march from Pleasant Valley and likely to arrive before mid-morning. With that disparity of force, a sequence of strong, coordinated attacks by Hooker and Burnside on the northern and southern ends of the battlefield would have forced Lee to strip his center to the bare bones, making it vulnerable to a federal breakthrough. To achieve that breakthrough, McClellan would have had to keep a close eye on the fighting on each flank, evaluate the success of those attacks, and judge the right moment to commit much if not all, of his reserve to smash the weakened Confederate center. So yes, given the circumstances, 
even little Mac's half-baked plan, such as it was, if adequately executed, should have been enough to subject Lee's defense to unbearable pressure. Okay, so that's what might have happened. Now, let's look at what actually happened. At about 2 p.m. on Tuesday afternoon, McClellan gave the order for Hooker to take the First Corps across the Antietam via the upper bridge and nearby Prize Ford. An hour or so later, George Meade's and James Ricketts' divisions began crossing the bridge, while Abner Doubleday's division used the Ford. Joseph Hooker had only been promoted from divisional to Corps command on September 6th, about a week and a half before Antietam. The First Corps had been part of John Pope's Army of Virginia, so Hooker, from the Army of the Potomac, was almost entirely unfamiliar with his new command. He had led the First Corps in one engagement at South Mountain as Wing Commander Burnside's subordinate. Now, at Antietam, though, Hooker was being asked to perform a critical, independent role in McClellan's battle plan. For Hooker to cross the Antietam and assail Lee's left flank was a complex, dangerous assignment, made more so by the fact that McClellan had little idea of Lee's actual dispositions in that sector and little knowledge of the lay of the land there north of Sharpsburg. The Maryland campaign's first true historian, Ezra Carman, points out that, quote, From the time of McClellan's arrival on the field until Hooker's advance in the afternoon of the 16th, nothing seems to have been done with a view to an accurate determination of the Confederate position. From the heights east of the Antietam, the eye could trace the right and center of Lee's line, but the extreme left could not be definitively located, nor was the character of the country on that flank known. This was proper work for cavalry, of which McClellan had a good body available, but it was not used. As far as we know, not a Union cavalryman crossed the Antietam until Hooker went over in the afternoon of the 16th, when the 3rd Pennsylvania accompanied him. On Tuesday afternoon, after receiving the order to cross the Antietam, Hooker rode to McClellan's headquarters to get additional information. He was told that once across the creek, He was to angle to the left and move south toward Sharpsburg, feeling for Lee's flank. Hooker was also told that he could call upon other corps for support if the need should arise. No sooner had Hooker crossed the Antietam than he told McClellan that unless the First Corps was reinforced, quote, the rebels would eat me up, end quote. Little Mac duly ordered Mansfield's 12th Corps to cross over the Antietam to support Hooker, but it wasn't until shortly before midnight that those troops crossed the stream in the 1st Corps' wake to stumble about in the darkness before finally settling in a mile or so to Hooker's left and rear. Meanwhile, Confederate cavalry had observed the movement of Hooker's troops after the Yankees crossed the Antietam, and this news was sent south to Jeb Stewart, who was at the Dunker Church. Stewart, in turn, sent word to Robert E. Lee that the Federals had crossed the stream and were moving toward the rebel left. The message reached Lee while he was meeting with Stonewall Jackson and James Longstreet at the home of Jacob Grove at the southwest corner of the Sharpsburg Town Square. Lee moved quickly to counter the enemy threat ordering Longstreet to move John B. Hood's two brigades north to deal with the Yankees, and directing Stonewall to move his divisions up to a position behind and to Hood's left. Meade's division of Pennsylvanians, advancing south down the Smoketown Road, got into a sharp fight with Hood's Confederates in the East Woods. Artillery on both sides joined in as the light faded. But Hooker wasn't looking for a battle just then, only a jumping-off point for the attack the next morning. A newspaper correspondent accompanying the Federals reported, quote, The fight flashed and glimmered and faded, and finally went out in the dark. By 10 p.m., it was pitch black, and the combat between Meade's Pennsylvanians and Hood's rebels faded to an occasional musket shot in the darkness. 
Hooker notified McClellan that he would open the battle at dawn. During the night, it started to rain gently but steadily, soaking the troops of both armies, who waited in the dripping darkness for what the next day would bring. They were all but certain that what the next day would bring was a big battle, so most of them prepared themselves to die, but hoped they would not. By evening's last light and the first gleam of dawn, many of the soldiers scribbled letters they knew might be their last, or jotted what might be final entries in diaries. Lieutenant Sebastian Duncan in the 13th New Jersey and the 12th Corps was surely not alone in his thoughts when he appealed to God for the courage to see him through the coming ordeal. Duncan wrote in his diary, saying, My earnest prayer is that I may do my duty. I am willing to leave it in God's hands. If I come through safely, I shall thank him. If killed, I hope I am prepared to meet him. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is To Antietam Creek, The Maryland Campaign of September 1862 by D. Scott Hartwig. To Antietam Creek is the first installment of a promised two-volume study of the campaign and battle. It takes the reader from McClellan's restoration to command through the Confederate invasion, the siege and capture of Harper's Ferry, the Battle of South Mountain, and up to the eve of the Battle of Antietam. Hartwig's website says he's currently working on the sequel, which will cover the battle itself, its aftermath, and the end of the campaign. So that's To Antietam Creek, The Maryland Campaign of September 1862 by D. Scott Hartwig. Don't forget you can find all of our book recommendations on the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then as we wrap up this show, just a quick but heartfelt thank you to the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade, Eric and Ed. Thanks, guys. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you'll join us again next time as we continue with the story of the Battle of Antietam. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.